Hi, my name is George Gordon and I'm an assistant professor uh, at UKRI Res Future Leaders Research Fellow um, in the Department of Engineering at the University of Nottingham. And to so today I've been asked to specifically talk to you about a topic of my research, one of the, the main topics of my research, which is holographic imaging through optical fibres. So I'm going to start just by talking about briefly what holographic imaging is and the definition I'm going to use for this talk. Then I've been asked to, to break the rest of the talk up into two specific parts. One is talking about what the three biggest successes to date are of holographic imaging through optical fibers. And then I'm going to talk about um, some of the key outstanding barriers to translating this technology to a clinical setting. So to start with, what is holographic imaging? Well, as I said, there's not really a definitive answer that I'm going to give you here, but for the purposes of this talk, uh, what I mean is using coherent light for illumination of the sample and also using uh, coherent detection of the light coming back. So you're detecting the phase uh, of the light um, at any given point. And in addition to this, I'm also going to add into that consideration of polarization. So if you're talking about highly coherent uh, light in, in terms of light from a laser, you also do need to consider the polarization. So what that basically means is the light that I'm using here is from a laser, so it's got a very well-defined frequency. Uh, and so each pixel on an image, um, instead of just looking at its amplitude like you would conventionally, you can also look at the offset between these sinusoidal wave fronts, which is the phase. Uh, and similarly, you know, if you have a very sharp wave front like that, a very coherent wave front, then you've got to consider this uh, polarization. So bringing that all together, uh, what this really means is we're thinking about um, the interference of, of waves. And here's a simple uh, demonstration of the kind of complex patterns you can get when you just got uh, four sources that are beating together at different spacings. So, so that's kind of the, the general idea of what holographic imaging really means. It's all about diffraction and interference of wave fronts. So I'm now going to talk about the sort of three key successes uh, that I've uh, identified in this area. So one really important thing for um, holographic imaging is that it has recently enabled the ability to image through our optical fibers, ultra thin optical fibers, despite the fact that they scramble light. So uh, I've given here a sort of intuitive example, which is the example of a multi-core optical fiber that's commonly used in medical imaging. And what happens is you send light down one core, but actually uh, it doesn't stay confined to that very well. By the time it gets to the other end, it's spread out a bit. So this kind of sp spreading out also includes phase shifts between these different paths down the fiber. And so ideally, for perfect fiber, you could just uh, coherently image straight through it, which is transport the optical field from here to here. But in reality, these imperfections mean that this is scrambled. So the use of holographic imaging, which effectively measures um, the phase of the wavefront, uh, emits a very simple model of this scrambling, which I'll just kind of briefly go over here, which is that you can consider every single point on the input uh, to be you know, to be denoted by an element in a, in a vector, and every single uh, point on the output, you know, perhaps discretized on a camera and a uh, rectangular grid here, to be uh, denoted by another vector y. Well, if you're using holographic imaging, then the relationship between y and x is just linear. So each y is just a weighted sum of all possible input values, okay, so which we can write like this. And so if, if we then uh, relate that together, what we can find is that uh, each single Y has a different set of weights based on uh, how it depends on the inputs. And so we can actually write that as a matrix. So we have an input vector times a matrix times an output vector. It's perfectly linear. And this linearity means that um, any distorted output that you get, um, like this middle row here, you know, you can invert that matrix and get recovered input over here. Furthermore, because you can um, recover this image, because it's holographic imaging, you, you get not only the amplitude, but you also get the phase information, which means you get the full wavefront, and so you can do correction um, for, you know, for defocus. So here's an example from a recent paper of mine, which just showed that we can move the sample a millimeter away from the end of the fiber, uh, and 
using this phase information we can correct for the defocus. So uh, the second key success I think is that if you're using this uh, holographic approach and you're really being forced to consider the phase of the wavefront, well then it's not too big a jump to also consider the polarization of the wavefront. You simply have to consider the phase, you know, for, for two different, uh, split the output using a beam splitter or something like that, and then consider the phase in both angles. Um, so, so, so using this holographic imaging, we can then fit a model uh, of, of our sample. So here I've used an elliptical retarder followed by a partial polarizer, and then you can use Stokes or Muller uh, polarimetry to actually uh, fit, uh, fit this model to the data you get. And here's an example where I've done that through an optical fiber uh, and I've made, managed to fit, uh, you know, I've got here four different polarization parameters uh, that I've managed to recover from the samples. So that's really nice and that, and that brings you extra information that you couldn't normally get, you know, retardance axis, die attenuation axis. Um, but I think there's, there's a lot more to be done in this area because um, there, there are things that this can detect that I've got here, such as chirality, uh, which could potentially be used for detecting things uh, like glucose or other chiral molecules. So I think there is um, a lot to be explored in, the, in this area. And a, a third success of holographic imaging is the ultra-sensitive detection of uh, optical scattering. So the kind of concept being that uh, in a very, very early stage cancer, you get these uh, you know, very disordered microstructure that starts to form on a very small scale. Um, both from the cell structure and also from these dense networks of collagen. And this reflects light um, a bit more differently. This is more of a specular reflection and this is more like a sort of diffuse uh, reflection here. And uh, actually, we were actually able to show uh, that when we image some mouse esophageal tissue, here's some healthy on the left and here's some tumours on the right. This is a DAPI stain so we can see increased density of cell nuclei. Uh, using the optical phase information and looking at the deform the f level of deformity of the wavefront, we could actually see improved contrast using the phase information compared to just using the amplitude information alone. So those are kind of three successes, recent successes that I've identified about uh, holographic imaging. So now I'm just going to talk a bit about some of the translational challenges. Uh, you know, why isn't this technology being widely used in clinic? Well. Without going into too much detail, here's the optical system um, that I use for many of the results that I showed before. Now, the problem is, is that to translate this, uh, you, a person would need to swallow all that equipment there, which I must say is, is rather large. So reducing the size of this is a key translational challenge. And the way I'm planning to approach that is, uh, you know, I've, I've proposed to approach that is, is to um, basically use miniaturized optics on the end of the fiber uh, particularly enabled by the use of metasurfaces. So here I've got this kind of stack with different filters in it and I've got metasurfaces in between. And by doing that, you can actually effectively miniaturize a lot of the passive optics from the previous slide and stick it on the end of the fiber. Um, you know, and so this is uh, you know, something that other groups are working on too. So people are using two photon techniques and also um, you know, standard electromagnetography techniques. Uh, to make uh, nanostructures on the end of fiber. So I think there's a, a lot of potential there. And I think, you know, one really exciting potential of being able to get to this level of miniaturization is the potential to actually put all of this advanced topics on the end of the fiber that can go through a needle and then be inserted into the body. Second translational challenge is the measurement and reconstruction speed. So current systems can take minutes uh, to take a characterization measurement. And this is challenging because you might have to take characterization measurements every time the fiber is bent because it upsets that transmission metric I talked about earlier. So there are some possible solutions to this as well. One is to exploit known sparsity. So in the case of multicore fiber, that simply means sending multiple beams down. But this has been generalized by some uh, colleagues of mine at uh, University of Exeter into actually a way of, of sort of doing the minimum possible number of measurements for a multi-mode fiber. Um, and you know another way of speeding this up is to move from using spatial light modulator devices with liquid crystals that are quite slow to using high speed digital mirror micro devices and it's, there are people working on that too. So it's not just the characterization time that needs speeding up, 
the reconstruction time, which is taking these characterization measurements and recovering images, can also be a bit slow. So one solution to that that has, uh, is, is promising for the future uh, is, is to actually use pre-trained neural networks. So you train them on a huge data set of input and output things, and then they can, once it's been trained, it can very quickly um, do the recovery for you. So I guess the final uh, major translational challenge is, is the sensitivity and specificity high enough uh, of this holographic imaging technique? And this is a difficult question because, uh, you know, you can ask this really of, 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 of any approach um, that's not yet been clinically validated. Um, and it will depend on the exact application. But for this particular technology, the way I like to look at it is one possible solution is to view holographic imaging as, as a platform that actually enables implementing multiple different imaging modalities in a single mode, in a single probe. So for example, there are different groups around the world um, you know, I've, that are doing different techniques. So I've showed phase imaging and polarization through fiber, but a lot of other people uh, have been working on confocal imaging through multi-mode fiber, including uh, fluorescence confocal imaging. There are people that have done um, OCT uh, through ultra optical fibers and also multi-photon imaging. So I think kind of all these techniques could be enabled by a holographic control of light through optical fibers. The vision then is to enable a wide range of advanced microscopy techniques to be transported to the end of the fiber. And with that, I'd like to end my presentation and thank uh, my collaborators at Nottingham and Cambridge uh, and the funders of my research.